to the House of the Conqueror. I'm Johnny B. Crazy and let's get right into it. I will be highlighting parts of the story that I feel are relevant and we won't necessarily go through the whole episode chronologically. I'm going to ask questions and try to answer them using Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology as a guide. So let's have fun exploring the mythos of this show. 541 meters lets us a little more inside the life of the giants and the mystery that is Loritz. Lord seems to have an awakening of his own and in true Loki fashion is living in and thriving in both the world of the gods and the giants. It also gives us more of a look at Magnus' persona, his ability to investigate and a constant need to seek for justice. So let's get into this episode and I will break it down. I know I can't see it all. So I ask for your help and to please leave a comment if you think I've missed anything or if you have something to add and I will surely address it in the next video. Let's start with a couple of great comments about the last episode, New Boy, and what it could mean going forward. John St. Baptiste writes, Isolde is the tragic heroine in the legend of Tristan and Isolde. Wagner eventually used it as an allegory for one of his greatest operas. It's a very nice pickup and a tragic, tragic love story with a little bit of silver lining at the end. A possible tree or two. If you haven't checked out the story of Tristan and Isolde, please do. And let's see if we can use that for other couples that we see this season, because I think there may be another couple that fits that. Our next comment is from Katrin C. from my point of view. The inscription on the hammer, I think it is an S from the old Futhark, the oldest form of the runic alphabet, found on artifacts, jewelry, tools, weapons, and rune stones from the second to the 8th century. Wow, thank you so much Katrin, and we will have to look at that and see what the S means. Hmm, could it connect to something? If any of you know, let me know what you think. We're speaking of the rune that is on the back of the hammer. This rune is also on the saw, it seems to be on all of the tools. My best guess is an ownership mark of someone powerful. In the last episode, we left Magna in mourning, and he had just heaved a hammer and farted in the general direction of Vidar's car. Your mother was a hamster, and your father smelt of elderberries. As we find out this episode, the hammer and his fart went about one and a half kilometers, much to the astonishment of myself and Magna. Vidar is not pleased and is on a mission to find out who destroyed his windshield. Magna's mother almost chokes to death when she sees the hammer stuck in Vidar's windshield. Now, throughout the series, people tend to get a little choky around giants. Let's stick a pin in that. Maybe it's because the giants represent chaos, pollution, and death. Let me know what you think. Vidar admits to Ron that he killed Asolda because she had been in the tunnel and seen the door. Asolda's phone is missing and it needs to be found. So much is at stake for the Utils now, and Magna has been asking a lot of questions. To top it off, Ron tells us that Vidar had a thing for Turid back in the day. We will get to that in just a minute, but maybe that's why she's choking. Meanwhile, Magna continues to learn about himself and his powers this episode, recording all of his progress as he goes along. He is clearly more powerful when his emotions are involved. Only being able to heave the hammer less than half the distance as the night of the soldier's death, 541 meters. It's a damn good throw still, I might add. The whole town is grieving after the tragic passing of a soldier, especially Magna and Eric. It makes me think of the death of Baldur and how tragic that loss was to the gods, giants, and mortals alike. It was an event that triggered Ragnarok and sent Thor on a path of revenge. The women wept, and the men, the children, and the animals. Birds of the air wept for Baldur, as did the earth, the trees, 
the stones, even the metals the messengers encountered wept for Balder. All things wept for Balder. Her father, Eric, is the teacher we meet in the first episode. He is tore up inside with grief and even pushes himself back to work right after his daughter's death. With her memorial in the room, might I add, I cannot imagine the pain this father feels for the loss of his child. Asolda's mother had already passed from cancer at 36, another thing that bonded Asolda and Magna together. The local authorities declare it an accident that Asolda was struck by lightning, but Magna pokes holes all through their story. What are they covering up and why? I will tell you. The Utils are notorious for their pollution of the town but have been able to avoid being caught. Magna finds out Asolda was fast on their trail. Treachery is afoot and Thor can smell its greasy asshole. It's all too clear now that Asolda's death wasn't an accident. Foul play had been involved and the Utils seem to have motive and opportunity. Whatever is behind that door Asolda found, is important enough to silence her. Could Loritz have somehow been involved? Maybe. We can't know for sure, but Vidar was definitely the cause and is starting to become paranoid. He cannot let Magna find out what happened. It would ruin the illusion and the fragile peace the giants live in with humans. They have to hide their true nature, using money and influence to get what they want. It seems that Vidar will have to get his hands dirty to stop Magna who seems to be a natural sleuth. He's able to instantly process crime scenes and put clues together without even thinking about it. The tension between the two intensifies as we go on. Magna goes to Eric, Asolda's father, to inform him of his suspicions and that the police have changed their story from lightning hitting Asolda to her hitting the mountainside. Eric is overwhelmed and tells Magna to take it easy. Magna loses his shit. And then Eric ends up inviting him back in and giving him a soulless diary. This is where we leave off with Eric and Magna. In the first episode, Magna started to have a crush on Gree, a fellow classmate that is sweet, smart, and seems to appreciate Magna, even for his faults, although she denies being his friend to Saxa. She hangs with the popular crowd but stays on the outside, focusing more on her schoolwork. This is Magna's love interest for our story and I can't help but wonder if Gree is perhaps an unawakened goddess. Thor had a wife and her name was Sif. Thor's wife was the beautiful Sif. She was of the Asir. Thor loved her for herself and for her blue eyes and her pale skin, her red lips and her smile. And he loved her long, long hair the color of a field of barley at the end of summer. If Magna is to make Gree his lady, then he's gonna have to get through the friend zone. Please, God, easy. And Fjör, who she has a crush on and doesn't know he's a giant. Fjör and Gree's love story becomes quite romantic, believe it or not. Fjör is not as one-dimensional as he seems, and Gree witnessing him getting beat by his father will only bring them closer together. Will Fuhrer eventually go against his family and his nature for love? Are they Romeo and Juliet? Only time will tell. In the meantime, Magna can't win for losing at this point, but he's not one to give up. It's Saturday night and Lawrence has the fever. They aren't doing the disco though. Fuhrer puts on a record so he and Saxa can boogie. This crazy beat drops with possible Old Norse lyrics, let me know if you know what they say. They are gyrating and doing the stanky neck, which seems to be a form of self-induced chiropractic hypnosis. <laughs> Their dance is very odd but symbolic. Ron also responds to this while she's banging some students. I'm pretty sure that's not following Proto, bud. It's you. you know what? You're fired, okay? You didn't follow Proto. What do you, how do you get a job here? seems to be an old ritual to the giants, which we can see that Loritz responds very strongly to. We also see Loritz change his form, so to speak. This is all the confirmation I need to tell me that Loritz is Loki. Now I will say we never get an outright answer this season, but more clues will continue to drop throughout each episode. Loritz seems to be in with the popular crowd and is cozying up to his distant relatives or, better yet, his brother and sister. I feel like Loritz is finding the piece of himself that he's been missing in his life, something that has been gnawing at him for a while now. 
How much does Lawrence actually care about Magna and Turret? It's hard to tell. Does he loathe them for feeling like a black sheep? Loki is Odin's blood brother. The other gods do not know when Loki came to Asgard or how. He is Thor's friend and Thor's betrayer. So if he doesn't yet, he will because it seems to me that Loritz is the son of Vidar. Yes, I said it. He doesn't look or act like Magna or his mother. He seems most comfortable with Saxa and Fjord. And we know from Ron that Vidar had a crush on Turid that I believe developed into something more. Vidar always gets what he wants and Loritz was the product of that union in my opinion, requiring them to leave town and perhaps resulting in the death of Magna's father, Asbjorn. We decide who lives and who dies, Vidar admits to Fjord. Loritz makes a comment about not remembering his father in the first episode as well, leaving an opening for a baby daddy situation with Vidar in the future. You are the father! Not to mention his looks and personality do not match his mother and brother. Do you think Vidar is Loritz's father? His father was said to be Farbalti, a giant. His name means he who strikes dangerous blows, and Farbalti was as dangerous as his name. Let me know in the comments what you think. While we are on Vidar, could he be Thrym? This is such an intriguing thought, and even if he isn't, this is a nod to it, and there are more indications throughout this season. We made this cute dog last episode named Trim, which is suspiciously only one letter off of the Lord of Ogre's name, Thrym, who stole Thor's hammer and demanded Freya's hand in marriage as a ransom for the safe return of one of the most prized possessions in all the Nine Worlds. Behind him, Loki saw a huge grave mound, and sitting on it, plating a dog collar, was the hugest, ugliest ogre of a giant he had ever seen. Who are you? asked Loki. The ogre grinned and showed his teeth. Why, Loki, son of Lofi, I am Thrym, lord of ogres. If Vidar is Thrym, it makes sense for a few reasons. His dog, of course. Thrym is famous for plating dog collars and his obvious dominance and control over his family. Also, if you put Turid in Freya's place, it would account for the lust Vidar had or still has for Magna's mother, adding possibly more evidence to the Lord's baby daddy conspiracy. Let's be on the lookout for that. Giants seem to be urinating in front of people all the time. No class. Fjord refuses to mourn for Isolde and goes so far as to pee on her memorial. Old Thok won't weep for Balder, she said bluntly. Alive or dead, old Odin's son brought me nothing but misery and aggravation. I'm glad he's gone. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Let hell keep him. And we see Vidar may agree with him, but he must punish Fjör for desecrating Isolde's memorial. He is either the most physically powerful giant in the family, a master of emotional manipulator, or both. He has a strong pimp hand. I tell you that. Baby powder ain't got nothing on Vidar. With baby powder? Smell that is. You changing diapers? There is a case in a later episode that portrays him as an Utgarda Loki figure king of the giants of Utgard. In reality, I think Vidar is a composite character of at least three giants in the mythos. Thrym, Utgard Loki, and Frobalti. In the stories, Thor dresses up as a woman, disguised as Freya, and ends up killing Thrym and his entire family and friends. He hit Thrym with his hammer only once, but once was all it took. The ogre fell to the straw-covered floor and did not rise again. All the giants and ogres fell beneath Thor's hammer, the guests at the wedding that was never to be. Even Thrym's sister, who received a bridal gift she had not been expecting. This has yet to be seen in Ragnarok, but Vidar's entire family seems to be a threat to the town, the world, and more importantly, Magna's friends. I think Magna will take the whole family down just like Thor. Maybe not in a wedding dress though. What do you think? With this thought and the symbolism that I believe is shown in the shot of the hammer in Vidar's windshield, is it possible that Vidar has Thor's hammer hidden somewhere? Or could this be a metaphor that by defeating Vidar, Magna can claim his full potential and power? 
The funeral for Isolde caps off the episode with Magna and family coming home to a ransacked house. Vidar has searched for Isolde's cell phone everywhere and knows Magna is on to him. The game is on. The beautiful thing about this story is that it can mean something different for you than it does for me. Whether you relate to Magna, Loritz, Gree, Fjord, or any of the other characters, Ragnarok has a story for you. This episode was gripping and you really feel the loss of Isolde throughout. The impact it created resonated through Edda and along with Fjord's actions have put the youthful's livelihoods at stake. Lords has had his coming out party and is fitting in rather nicely. There is a bond between him and the Utils. What is that bond? I think it's because Lords is a hidden giant and Vidar's son. What was the nature of the relationship between Vidar and Turid before they left town? Does Turid know who her son really is? Are the Utils a real family? All of these questions and more we will try to answer in the upcoming breakdowns. So please, Leave me some of the questions you have after watching episode 2 below and let's try to answer them throughout this series. Be sure to support my crazy and hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and share it around. Get your friends interested in this show. I would like to give a special thank you to all my patrons. If you would like loads of archived content and access to even more, click the link below and become part of the crazy crew. Thank you all so much for watching and I hope to see you on the next visit to the House of the Conqueror.